New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at the decades long battle to end UFO secrecy by the United States government. My guest is Linda Powell, who is the author of a wonderful new book, Against the Odds, Major Donald E. Kehoe and his battle to end UFO secrecy. Linda is based in the United Kingdom. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Linda. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm glad to be invited. You've spent six years working on your book, Against All Odds, about the career of Major Donald Kehoe. I, I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about what inspired you to take on a project like that. Because I used to think that uh, people who were interested in UFOs were a little bit weird. And then I happened to see a documentary which changed my mind. It was a serious documentary. And so I became interested in looking at the uh, uh, serious aspect of it and found Kehoe wherever I went in the history of research. And I wanted to read a biography of him but found that no one had ever written one. So uh, I decided um, that I would like to try, and that's where it began. Would, did you have a, a background as a researcher or a writer or a UFO investigator of any sort? No, nothing really. Um, I, research, I think, is very important, and whatever interests me, I tend to research it very deeply. When, um, when it comes to writing a book, it seems to me, if it's a non-fiction work, it has to be properly researched, because the reader has to have confidence in whatever you have written. And so, and besides which, in all honesty, I absolutely love doing research. I could do it 24 hours a day and still not have done enough. I, I really, really enjoy it. I have to say, Linda, I think it's the most well-researched book in the UFO field that, that I've ever seen. It's uh, amazing, all of the detail and, and the fact that you remained true to the project over six years of uh, going through very, very complex files and cases and, and different phases in, in the life of Major Kehoe. So, uh, it's definitely for, for any viewer out here who is serious about understanding the history of the field of ufology, uh, particularly in the United States, this is a must read book. And uh, I'm delighted that you're here with me today. And let's dig into the career of, of Donald Kehoe. He was a major, I gather, an Air Force major. Uh, what else can we say about his qualifications for becoming, in his day and age, probably the foremost spokesperson for the field of UFO research? Well, he, uh, he, he wasn't Air Force, he was Marine, a Marine aviator. Um, and it was really by a set of unusual but relevant circumstances that he went from being um, a second lieutenant in the Marines, he was injured and retired from the Marines as a result of that, and found himself working for the Department of Commerce. And at that time, uh, it coincided with President Coolidge's uh, determination to develop civil aviation. Uh, marine aviation was neglected. The government wanted to, at last, make it a project. So um, Kehoe 
was working for the Coast and Geodetic Survey, which came under the Department of Commerce. They liked what he did. They made him editor of, um, of their bulletin. That came to the attention of um, uh, Herbert Hoover, who was then in charge of the Department of Commerce. And so he was, he, he was the right man doing the right stuff at the right time. That launched him. Um, and because of his aviation work, which took him into middle age, he found himself working for True magazine, uh, doing um, test flights on various uh, aircraft, writing aviation articles for them. And when Ken Purdy took over at True magazine in uh, 1948, he had already been investigating what he thought might be an Air Force cover-up after the Mantell incident of 1948. And um, he pushed Kehoe into investigating on behalf of True. So reluctantly he did that, and that's where he got going with the UFOs. Let's talk about the Mantell incident. I I remember as a child, I, I uh, was reading these books in 1958. I turned 12 years old and was reading every book I could find about UFOs. And the Mantell case was very prominent in that era. Kehoe had, in fact, been interested in it himself before True set him on the on the path for it because he'd been making his own inquiries but didn't find out anything relevant. Um, I wasn't able to find any record relating to his investigation of Mantell. It's only what he tells us in his writings. But whatever he did find convinced him that it was not a skyhook balloon which he said was not secret because it was known about in 1947. Um, And whoever he spoke to, his contacts in the military and so forth, uh, he felt convinced that uh, there was something more going on. And uh, that spurred him on. The rest of his his investigation I couldn't find out about for true. Um, But that certainly was one of the big planks of the platform. And he stuck with that forever. Well, the Mantell case, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mantell was a a pilot who reported a a sighting of a UFO, and he decided to chase after it. Uh, All of that, I gather, was recorded on radio communications. But as he was chasing this apparent UFO, his, his plane crashed, and he died. Mm, yeah, that's the story. Um, there is debate about that. And of course, if you were to look online at various um, sites that have gone into it, you'll find that there's a lot of, um, uh, there's, there's lack of clarity about who said what. Um, the, uh, the first press report didn't say anything about what he, Mantel, had said. Later reports said he'd cited something uh, metallic and tremendous in size. And then there were reports about the condition of his aircraft and the condition of his body. Uh, and none of these things turned out to be true. Uh, but but the, the thing became set in stone, really, is part of UFO research. Um, and sufficient, uh, as I say, Kehoe found out sufficient that convinced him that there really had been a sighting and perhaps an encounter. And uh, amongst people who were enthusiastic about UFOs, this became sort of a rallying call, as, as I remember it. Yes, I think it did. Yes, it's been uh, it's been around a long time, and uh, it the the consensus now is that it probably was a skyhook balloon. But as far as I know, unless I'm out of date. There never has been any firm evidence to show that the skyhook was in the area, um, but this has undergone a lot of analysis. So, but but the, the jury, as far as I know, is still out on that one. But it was Donald Kehoe's real introduction to the field of UFOs, and I gather it's what converted him 
from being uh, skeptical about the whole thing, as most people, I suppose, were at the time, to becoming gradually more and more of an enthusiast. That's true. It, 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 it certainly, I mean, as early as 1947, he was interested because he was going to the Pentagon after the Arnold sighting. Then 48, he inquired about Mantel, um, and then True set him on, on the course. He'd been a writer for a very long time and had a lot of credibility, uh, certainly for his aviation writing, because he'd been a pulp fiction writer for many years. And he was worried about losing his reputation, but he was so convinced um, that that really, that was it for him, and that was his life from that point on. So he began, from that point, writing books about uh, UFO phenomenon, particularly focusing on the craft themselves. I'm not sure that he focused on the craft. He certainly focused on reports, and he did his best to um, describe what had been seen. He was able to publish one photograph in a magazine which was taken by the uh, gun camera on an aircraft. I think it was the one over Harmon Field, a foggy image of a disc. Um, but uh, he, his, his main thrust really was how the Air Force, he believed, and the CIA were covering up uh, what they knew. And this then became a battle between him and them. And of course, they had won in the end. That's really the theme of, of our interview today. And it makes sense because here we are over half a century later, well over half a century later, three quarters of a century <laughs> later. And the issue of government secrecy concerning UFOs is still paramount in, in the public eye. There have been uh, hearings in Congress about it just within the last few months. So, if anybody is interested in this question, it's the Donald Kehoe story is central to, to the question because he was fighting that battle so long ago, the very same battle that seems to be taking place today. Yes, exactly. History is repeating itself. When, when I read reports of what's been going on in terms of what the Air Force says and what the Department of Defense says and everybody else, and then you have people like Leslie Kane who are uh, trying to uh, get transparency on this. And, she, and in some ways, she's very much like Kehoe, I think. You know, she, she talks to the right people. She, uh, follows what she can and uh, tries to get it talked about and um, goes as far as it's possible to go with it. But we're still in the same position that we were 75 years ago. It, it is just the same. I read it now and I think, well, this is exactly what Keo had to de deal with. Uh, and, and so it's all the same. No nothing has moved on, really. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Leslie Kane. She's been interviewed on this channel several times. Uh, in fact, she is the person who uh, wrote to me recommending that I get a hold of you and, and do this interview because she sensed how important your work is to the work she is doing. And, and she's the journalist, I believe, who is largely responsible for bringing the reports of the whistleblower, David Grush, uh, in front of the public and even in front of Congress. So, uh, she has become a key player in uh, all of this lately. Yes, that's right. I think she's the key hill of our time, really. Um, and I can only hope that she's going to get something conclusive and get more openness. Um, Kehoe did have success in 1952 uh, getting openness, but then that was closed off and we ended up in the position then where we still are. So, fingers crossed, Leslie can, you know, break open a few more doors and windows and, uh, and, and, and get where Kehoe could not go. Let's talk about that event in 1952. What happened then? Well, that was the year of the big wave, of course, over Washington. Um, and that alerted a lot of people, 
to the idea that something was going on and so much of it was going on that it had to be investigated. And at that time, there was Project Blue Book, which was on the go at that time. Edward Rupert was um, the head of, of Blue, Book, Blue Book at that time. And behind him, he had sympathetic characters, Dewey Fournay um, and, other, uh, and Al Chop, of course, who was the uh, Pentagon spokesman. So there was a small group of people who themselves uh, felt that Kehoe was on the right track and felt it was important that information should be given out responsibly. Uh, so he was working then happily with an interested group, uh, but that didn't last long enough. And by 1953, when the Robertson panel convened, which is a whole other story, and, and I, ref I detail that in the book, then that was it, the door was closed and it never opened again. And everything following that was in effect based on uh, the Robertson panel approach, which was nothing to see here, we don't want to talk about it, let's just move on. And that's where we are now. So even today, it's a mystery as to the extent uh, of the government's information uh, as it was in Kehoe's time, but he himself believed that he had very blatant examples of the government having information and then lying about it to the public, saying, we don't have any such information, it doesn't exist. Yes, that's right. He was always coming up against this um, uh, denial and intransigence and this absolutely infuriated him. And the more they did it, the the more he doubled down on trying to get them to admit. And he just he just harangued them uh, from really from his first book, which came. The article came out in late forty nine. The book based on it, the Flying Sources of Real, in nineteen fifty, and through magazines. Um, his books, and then through NICAP, it was. Uh, I examined many, all of the UFO investigators, and I don't think I could find a handful where the Air Force wasn't the main subject and were being torn to shreds by him all the time. So it was this antagonism. Um, the Air Force were fretting over public relations more than anything else. He was fretting that they're lying to us, they know what's going on, why won't they tell us? And it was this, at times, ridiculous, if not risible, competition going on between them. Now, you mentioned NICAP, uh, which was uh, one of the very first civilian UFO research organizations. Kehoe became the director of NICAP. I believe he held that position for 13 years. Let, let's talk a little bit about that organization. Most people will know that it was started by Townsend, Thomas Townsend Brown, who was a scientist uh, about whom very little is known. Um, I dug into uh, Townsend Brown's story as best I could. There's not a lot to go on, but what I did find is that his, um, his contacts and the people he associated with had very strange backgrounds. There was a lot of contacteeism among his group. And according to Brown's daughter, Brown himself was a contactee. He believed in the Space Brothers. So that was very peculiar. Um, whether or not he was CIA linked, I couldn't say. There's long been suspicions about that. But the fundamental problem was, according to people who uh, were close to him at the time, in particular Maurice Jessup, who later became infamous for the Philadelphia experiment story. Um, he said that Brown didn't really know much about UFOs, um, didn't know about the UFO groups, and was really in it to make money for himself. Um, so it was all very 
um, very unsatisfactory. And it was doomed from the start because he apparently ran many debts. Uh, he got effectively thrown out by an angry Kehoe. Um, Kehoe took over temporarily and then became permanent head of the organisation. And at that time, I should mention that uh, NICAP was so impoverished that the only money it had was a dollar forty, and that was it. So that's how bad things were when he took over. And he uh, ran the organization for, uh, I think, about thirteen years. Uh, and uh, he took over in what year? In uh, January fifty-seven. In January of 1957, which would be right after the important film of 1956 known as the Utah film, which I understand was very important to Kehoe. Yes. Uh, when he learned about it, he dug deep and found that the Air Force had seen it. And uh, initially, they were um, of the view that there was something to it and then denied it. And there was a report on which they denied, and he had some proof that there was a report. Um, and eventually, he was proved right, yes, that they, they did indeed um, have it. And they, um, it, if I can remember the dates correctly, it was in 1956 that the Air Force helped to release a um, a film, uh, the title of which I should be able to remember and can't, um, but about UFOs and it, 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 uh, the Utah film was shown in that. So Kehoe was perfectly correct. If I recall correctly, the Utah film showed a number of UFOs, I think, flying in a formation that was analyzed very carefully by the Air Force to determine, could these have been balloons or birds or, or something else? And they basically concluded that it was nothing that we understood at all. That's right. That was their conclusion. But, um, of course, it was knocked down. Um, and uh, they tried to disregard it. Um, so it was always a bone of contention. And he would mention the Utah film many times in his writings. Once he got a bee in his bonnet, it buzzed forever. And he, he just never let it go. And, and as I recall from your book, uh, he was accused of, of lying about the conclusions that the Air Force had drawn about that film. And so he challenged them and said, look, if I lied, I'm a, a, a Marine officer. You should have me court-martialed. Yes, indeed. Yes, he, he, he pulled out all the stops and he was quite serious about that, I think. Um, yes, he, uh, that would be... Um, I should know this. I've written the book, but it would either, it was probably the, the uh, Joe Kelly uh, incident because there were two very similar incidents the same year. But uh, it was either Joe Kelly or Omar. I think it was Kelly who accused him of lying, and he was absolutely furious about that. And that was another uh, story that he would never let go, and would use it repeatedly to show how they accused him of lying. And yet he was able to establish that he'd been telling the truth. And, and of course, uh, he had many trials and tribulations in his life, but he was never court-martialed for lying about these UFO reports. Yes, exactly. Yes, he, th he threw down the gauntlet and they never picked that one up. In this era, when he became the director of NICAP, there was another prominent civilian UFO organization with which I had an indirect relationship myself called APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization run by a woman named Coral Lorenzen. And I, sh I should point out for the benefit of viewers that when I was a graduate student in Berkeley, studying parapsychology and UFOs, one of my faculty advisors in, in that era was James Harder, who has also been interviewed on the original Thinking Aloud channel, and we've released that video on this channel. Harder was the research director of APRO, and 
So for many years, uh, especially in the in the early days of NICAP, Coral Lorenzen of APRO was very supportive and very friendly toward Donald Kehoe. Yes, she very much admired him, and she would. Uh, they had a long correspondence, and um, she uh, saw him as a, a mentor, I think, and was quite gushing about how much she admired him. She would write letters to him, praising him, and in the APRO bulletin, she plugged him wherever she could. And they had a very good relationship, even though they didn't see eye to eye about the little men, which is how aliens were referred to at that time. Not little green men, but little men. She was interested in exploring them much more than Don Quixote. Um, but it, it seemed to me from my research that he had to be so very, very careful about uh, getting involved with that angle. He didn't deny that they existed. Uh, of course, somebody had to find those sources. Um, but because the contactees had made such a stir, he felt, no, I'll, I'll go with factual sightings. That, that was his focus. But yes, Cole admired him up until 1958, and then everything changed. The contactee movement, of course, it's transformed itself. It's morphed several times, I think. Many people who are alive today watching this video probably don't remember George Adamski, for example, and, and the big impact that, that he had. I, I recall as a child reading his, his book, I think it was called Flying Saucers Have Landed, and about his personal conversations with a Venusian being with long blonde hair. And I, of course, I was like a 10-year-old child at the time. I, did, I, I didn't doubt it uh, as a child. I figured if it's in a book, it must be true. And I imagine a lot of people felt that way. And, and in fact, it became one of the major controversies that Kehoe had to deal with inside of his own organization. That's right. Adamski was um, a, a very uh, difficult problem for, for NICAP. He was certainly the most difficult of all the contactees. And in a sense, as much as Kehoe was perhaps the founding father of ufology, Adamski was the founding father of the contactees. I think that we could make a case for that. And many followed him, but none of them were as big or as influential as he was. And he was absolutely the bane of Kehoe's life. And within NICAP, um, in the early NICAP, he had um, uh, one particular devotee that was NICAP's secretary. And um, uh, as I detail in the book, there was a, an awful lot of trouble over that. Which caused it. 1958, which is the, um, the, the year in which matters came to a head with his secretary, was a terrible year for Kehoe. Everything went wrong, and the contactees featured largely in that very turbulent period for him. So he was able to get rid of the secretary uh, and other members of staff who were right minded, but that left him virtually on his own. Uh, so it, it was a very difficult time for him, yes. I think it's fair to say that if the reports of the contactees were accurate, it would have been of extraordinary social and scientific significance uh, to such an extent that it ought not to be ignored if it were real. But at the same token, I, I'm pretty sure that. Uh, it would be a fair consensus today to say that Adamski was a fraud. I don't know about all of the other contactees. I don't think they were all fraudulent, but 
by all accounts, and, and I've done interviews on this with other contactees who knew Adamski, such as Ray Stanford, who tells me that Adamski pretty much admitted to him that he was uh, fraudulent, that he had made up a, a great deal of what he had written. Yes. Uh, I looked into that, and uh, you're right about Ray Stanford, um, and he is mentioned in the book. And during um, uh, Kehoe's tussles with Adamski, he was able to expose some of his shenanigans. And I detail in the book, uh, taken from the correspondence, uh, Kehoe's correspondence, um, one incident reported to Kehoe, which should leave one in no doubt that Adamski was just um, a hoaxer. Um, I think I think Adamski um, at some point believed that he had by chance landed on something genuine. Uh, the Straith letter which I detail in the book, was a very um, interesting ex experience for him because that seemed to validate for him personally that, well, everything I say, as it happens, must be true. But, of course, the straight letter was a hoax and was exposed as such. And Adamski wouldn't let that go. Um, so, and I give other examples in the book where his hoaxing is being exposed and how he had simply developed um, a, a phony cult that he established in the 1930s and then changed it to suit the idea of contact with Venusians to suit his own purposes, really. Well, it does seem as if there was in, in this era of the 1940s and 1950s a, f a fair amount of overlap with practitioners of uh, various esoteric movements and uh, involving channeling, for example, and people who Claim to be UFO contactees of, of different types. There, it became, I guess it would be fair to say, it became something of a circus. Absolutely, yes. Um, Kehoe himself thought that he was, to some extent, responsible for this, and I would agree with that. Um, but they, they certainly became very active during his, uh, his interest in, in the UFO world. Um, and uh, this just created more aggravation for him, really, because they had a lot of followers. They had worldwide followers. Um, and uh, he, he just could never get past them. And, you know, they always had more publicity and more followers than the serious people ever had. It was very disappointing for him. So Kehoe took the position that NICAP should focus its research activities on sightings and reports of craft. And while he didn't deny the possibility that the craft had occupants and that there might be contact with those occupants, he didn't want to use the resources of NICAP, which had become, I suppose, at, at, in that era, probably the most prominent of the civilian UFO research organizations. He wanted to keep it focused on, on the actual sightings of craft. And, and the irony is that the organization itself had, had become, I guess one might say, infiltrated by a variety of contactees themselves. Yes, in the early years, that was certainly true. Um, the, the secretary I referred to, and there were a couple of other members of staff. It was a small staff to begin with, um, but but they uh, they caused a lot of problems to start with. Um, he never. The problem was also that he he was never able to develop an effective policy for dealing with the contactees, he ended up settling for one where he would say, if you can give me um, proof that this event has occurred, then we will consider it. But what he found, which wasn't unfair, but he found himself in the position where 
he um, was trying to be fair with them, which meant giving more time and attention than he should have. Uh, there was one instance where one of the contactees, thanks to his uh, contactee secretary that he didn't know about what she was up to at the time, um, had written to Kehoe and said, we're having a saucer convention, come along to this. And by the way, I have film of some saucers, which you might be interested in. Now, Kehoe then said, oh, well, let me have the film and we'll analyse it. Now, he didn't have to do that. And this cost NICAP time and money. So he didn't think things through because he wanted to be fair. Instead of just ignoring it, he actually expended time and money on this. Um, other other um, uh, research groups understood his difficulties. And uh, I think it was CSI New York. I think it was CSI New York. Their policy was no contactees, we don't respond to them. Just If you're a contactee, just get lost. We don't want to have anything to do with you. But thought they could do it because they were a small group. NICAT was an international group. And so they thought, well, he's, he's stuck really. He's more stuck than we are. So it was always a problem. Well, I guess it's fair if we're going to paint a picture of the ufology ecosystem in the 1950s or so. You've got NICAP and you've got APRO. They're large, prominent groups. They're well-known. They publish newsletters. Kehoe, of course, had published many books, I think, over the course of his lifetime, as many as 20 or so. But the there were many other smaller groups scattered uh, all over the not just north america but europe and uh, south america and probably in the soviet union and elsewhere yes it was definitely worldwide um and many of them looked either to to nicap in america as a sort of template and as an authority um, or they looked to Adamski and uh, and his uh, view. So it was it was really the two of them always there, depending on who you wanted to follow. But Nakat was certainly uh, the, the best known mm. and uh, influenced uh, groups in other nations to develop their own. So he, he was very influential. It's worth mentioning, I suppose, that Ray Stanford, about who we spoke a few minutes ago and who's been interviewed several times on this channel, sort of bridged both worlds. He, he was close to Adamski and attended the UFO conferences uh, organized by George Van Tassel and uh, uh, Joshua Tree area uh, in the Mojave Desert of California. But he was also a NICAP researcher and did one of the major investigations of the uh, famous Socorro UFO observations. I think that was 57 or so. Yes, he, he uh, was NICAP's investigator on that. And he took some samples from what appeared to be um, impressions left by the craft that Officer Zamora saw, although the samples proved to be uh, natural silicates, uh, which looked as though they were metallic scrapings. Um, but yes, he, he was certainly um, um, a, a very relevant uh, member of NICAP and did some useful work. First of all, let me, because we haven't spelled it out, what does NICAP stand for? National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. So during the 13 years that Kehoe was the director of the National Investigations Committee of Aerial Phenomena, he engaged in uh, must be hundreds of investigations of different UFO reports. I would say thousands. He didn't personally investigate any. He relied on others. Uh, but in terms of analyzing reports and interviewing military people, pilots and so on, there, was, there, there must have been thousands. I mean, it must have been in five, if not six figures, perhaps, over the years. 
So he, he seems to know about almost every uh, sightings report there was. He used a clipping service, which nowadays we use the internet. Um, but that was the, uh, the thing that you could use at the time. Newspapers would send you relevant material if you paid a fee. And uh, so he was always up to the minute. You were very rarely not have heard about a case. As a result of that, he possessed a vast archive of UFO reports. That's right, yes, indeed. And he uh, made NICAP's files available to any serious researcher. And he would invite the Air Force and the CIA uh, to come and have a look at his files. But uh, there was never really any, very much interest from either body in doing that. But his files were acknowledged to be very good. Uh, Jane, Dr. James MacDonald um, rated NICAP very highly, and he had gone through, I believe, uh, thousands of their cases personally and double-checked them and found that Kehoe's standards and accuracy was very high. And MacDonald, of course, was... Uh, a uh, very diligent and committed, a tr true scientist. So that was quite an accolade, I think. So it's fair to say that uh, as early as the 1950s, Kehoe had accumulated a vast, I would say probably overwhelming database indicating that UFOs were real, that they'd been observed uh, multiple times by credible witnesses and all sorts of circumstances and that there was a, a certain consistency to these reports. I think so. Yes, he um, he was always interested in reports from pilots. He, he respected them a great deal, as a pilot himself, of course. Um, and he, he could tell the difference between real reports and fake reports or misidentification. He was very adept at picking out what was the real stuff. Uh, so, uh, he, I mean, his knowledge, his, his personal knowledge within his head, if you like, must have been absolutely staggering. Uh, and you combine that with the thousands of reports that were held by NICAP and uh, most of them, I believe, have survived, uh, as in the ones that were held in NICAP itself. Uh, as to others, well, who knows? During this time, Kehoe was uh, involved in continually attacking the Air Force for withholding information from the general public. He felt that the best way to make progress in this area was that the public should be well informed. And even though he was in a struggle with the Air Force, he also tried to build bridges and work with people with, within the government whenever he could. Yes, he had some contacts. Uh, several congressmen were interested and helpful. Um, we don't know, however, a lot about many of his contacts. He would refer to people in the Pentagon or to highly placed military people, and he wouldn't identify them. And not all of the congressmen were identified either because they wanted to be anonymous. They felt it was wiser. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, he, he certainly uh, w was very well connected at, at, at high levels. We have to intimate some of that, but I do think that that's true. One of the people with whom he, at least for a while, had a good working relationship with was Edward Ruppelt, who you've referred to earlier, who was running Project Blue Book for the Air Force. Yes, they became friends, and this upset the Air Force quite a bit. Uh, Rupelt, uh, um, J. Allen Hynek described him as a weather vane, believing that he could never quite make up his mind whether there really was something or whether there was not. And in his dealings with Kehoe, he would 
teeter on the brink of agreeing with him and then pull back. Uh, but they, they did become friends. And then my research suggested to me that, as Kehoe himself thought, Rupert was given the hard word and told, you must recant on your apparent support. But while it lasted, it was very productive. Rupert never gave anything away to Kehoe that wasn't authorised, but he still got in trouble with the Air Force. And um, uh, that unfortunately led to their relationship coming to an end. And then Rupert died not long after. Well, I gather over time, the the weight of what he was attempting to do, get the government to disclose its secrets on the one hand, battle with the UFO contactees on the other hand, run a, a large international organization, which was probably underfunded and understaffed, maintain cordial relationships with the other leading UFO research, APRO, uh, things began to fall apart for for him. Maybe he wasn't the best business manager or uh, didn't take into account sufficiently the finances required to do everything he was attempting to do. Uh, but his position at NICAP became untenable. That's right. And, and the things you mentioned there were uh, high on the agenda for, for those who decided that he had to go. Um, I uh, During the last few years of Gordon Law's life, Gordon became assistant director of NICAP in its last few years. Um, uh, he was very keen on my biography and he, and he helped me where he could. And his personal experience of Kehoe uh, related it at times so his bad financial management. He remembers going to his house once and finding uncashed checks, often for large amounts, just left and they'd fallen behind the piano. Uh, Richard Hall, who preceded Gordon as NICAP assistant director, uh, was you know, exasperated by Kehoe's bad financial management, along with his absence from the office, uh, my feeling is that because Kehoe was so absolutely absorbed in the subject and he had domestic issues, his wife was unwell, which meant he had to stay with her at the house as much as possible, this then left him detached from NICAP and left the responsibility and the aggravation day-to-day -day with staff Kehoe didn't know what was going on half the time. And um, he would turn up and say, right, we're going to do this now. This is our new plan. And they would say, well, where is this come from? We don't know about it. And the aggravations and the tensions built up tremendously. Um, and what made things worse, and that's very clear from the UFO investigator, is that although members paid their dues and they were high by the standards of UFO groups at the time, um, he was on almost every issue, he was begging for more money. So members would pay their dues and then a small percentage would pay extra. So it was staggering along purely on the good graces of a small number of members and it just became... Uh, unsupportable. At the same time, Coral Lorenzen of APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, who had been a huge supporter of Kehoe in, in his early years, she became disenchanted with him. Yes, I, uh, I was intrigued by that when I first heard about it because I knew that they'd been uh, very much in accord to start with. And then Nobody really seemed to know why they fell out. It was assumed to be over their disagreement about the little men. Uh, the Lorenzans, her husband Jim as well, wrote about the occupants uh, and, and were very interested in them. who avoided them. But they, that to me didn't seem to be the answer because they both respected each other enough and knew each other's views and got along very well. 
with those views. When I dug into Kehoe and Cole's personal correspondence, um, it seemed to me that the fallout came because Cole felt humiliated by Kehoe's tactlessness over an embarrassing incident involving the famous psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Um, a bit of a long story, but Carl had thought Jung was on her side and, want, and was willing to be an honorary um, uh, advisor. And then she learned that due to an error, partly her own, partly someone else's, he was not on her side. He was still uh, uncertain about the UFO position. And I think she uh, felt that Kehoe's tactlessness in reporting on this in the UFO investigator, which made her look like a fool, was the moment when it soured. The correspondence supports that. Uh, and she really turned against him very, very bitterly, far more than, the, than anyone I think was aware of. I also found correspondence between Coral and uh, a Swedish investigator, uh, Kay Gosta Wren, uh, who she called Gus Wren. And she has no holds barred in absolutely tearing Kehoe to shreds in her letters with Gus. She... I wouldn't say hated him, but she despised him, that's for sure. It was a very, very uh, revealing correspondence between her and, and Gosterin. To give our viewers a little background, Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, wrote a book about UFOs. Uh, I think titled Flying Saucers, but his, his idea was that they were archetypal symbols and, and that the frenzy around the UFO phenomenon represented what he thought might be the birth of a new religion. Yes, uh, yeah, it was a very, uh, it was an individual of him, I think, yes, at that time, certainly. He wasn't necessarily convinced that the UFOs were real or that the occupants were were real. And and I gather that uh, Cora Lorenzen published in her newsletter a, a statement implying that uh, Carl Jung was on board with them as an advisor. And he had to publish uh, publicly a, a statement denying that, which was very embarrassing to her. But I gather over time they they made up. In fact, the, the, the suggestion is that he eventually did become at least an informal advisor to APRO and, and that Jung and uh, the Lorenzans had cordial relationships after that little blow up. Yes, that's quite true. Uh, the whole thing was um, the upset over the Jung uh, incident, as you mentioned, there was a stormy teacup, really. And they got back together and everything was uh, going fine. But uh, because of what Kehoe had to say about it, that, was, that spoiled it for, for, their, uh, for their record, certainly. But yes, Kehoe and, and Coral mended fences and moved on from there. You used the word schadenfreude to describe Kehoe's response to, to Carl Lorenzen's humiliation, that he seemed in, in his own newsletter to take a certain pleasure in, in the humiliation she was uh, f briefly facing. Yes, but I, I really don't think it was intentional. Uh, I, I did learn from his correspondence and from the yeah, UFO investigator, that he could be inadvertently very tactless indeed. And um, he upset people very often because he just didn't think it through. He didn't think how it would be read from their point of view. So I don't for one moment think he meant to do that. But because Coral had been humiliated internationally over this with Carl Jung, um, I think she then saw Kehoe in a different light and she would never see him differently ever again, which is unfortunate because it destroyed what could have been a productive relationship between the two major investigative bodies of that era.
So it's a great pity. Well, it is interesting that as we speak now in the year 2024, neither NICAP nor APRO is a major player in the ufology field. They both basically fizzled out for different reasons. Nevertheless, the research that both of those organizations engaged in remains uh, available and I would say very valid for people to look at today. Yes, I think it's very relevant. Um, and in some ways, um, one might feel that the reports and photographs available from that time perhaps are more reliable than what we have today because there's so much fake stuff out there, so much false reporting, and it's so much easier to do, to create deception now than it was then. And if somebody fakes a video on YouTube and it goes out there, for some people that's good enough, whereas for NICAP it never was. And for APA, and they, they would properly investigate this stuff. They'd talk to the pilots and they'd look at weather reports and uh, flight plans and so forth. So I, I'm not sure that that's getting done, certainly not by people who just casually look at YouTube and believe it to be real. So we're in a different time now, which gives, I think, more validity to those old reports. I suppose it would be fair to say that the major civilian UFO organization these days is MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and, and that uh, it's an outgrowth of APRO and NICAP. Yes, that's right. Uh, when NICAP folded, um, eventually MUFON had been uh, was well uh, on the move by then anyway. Um, but they took charge of, eventually took charge of the files. Um, and it, it was a kind of natural transition, really. The, the torch had to be passed to a new generation, if I can use that phrase. Um, but Kehoe was, was happy to see that happen. He didn't see them as rivals or, um, as upstart newcomers. He, he was quite pleased about that which was good. And I suppose it's, it's fair to say Kehoe, of, of course, has passed away. What, what year did he die? 88. That the, the battles that he fought, as, as you pointed out earlier, are still going on, are still being fought. Yes, that's true. Yes, nothing much has changed. Three quarters of a century, and he would recognize... If he were here now, if we could bring him back, he would say, well, where are we? No further. I think that's what he would say. But he was always optimistic. Virtually every article he ever wrote, every speech he ever gave would end with something like, but it's about to break. When this happens, we'll know. Uh, he, and he was like that to the end of his life. He, he never changed in that view. He thought something would break any moment. People still feel that way, that we're right on the verge of a major disclosure. But what does seem to be happening uh, with a slow trickle of leaks coming out of the government and many, many civilian UFO groups uh, reporting, we are getting a constant stream of, of information. Any member of uh, society who wishes to become well-informed on this topic, the, the resources are there. Yes, that's true. Um, it's uh, it, it, it certainly, as it always has been, really hanging in an interesting balance. Um, I mean, we're more connected now. You and I are talking now from other sides of the world. Um, so communications are available. More, much more information is available, more connections. If, if uh, Kehoe had had what we have now, it's interesting to consider what he might have achieved. Um, so the situation isn't without promise, but it's without progress. That's, that's really the thing, I think. There have been, for example, 
public hearings. There have been videos released from the Department of Defense. I'm pretty sure at this point, many high-ranking officials have acknowledged that whatever it is that Navy pilots uh, have sighted and have filmed and have been seen on radar, that it is nothing that can be accounted for by any known earthly technology. I think we have gotten that far, wouldn't you say? Well, yes, I would agree. If they're prepared to admit that, that would be wonderful if, if Kehoe could have heard that. He would hear it quietly. He'd hear it behind the scenes. So it is good that we're hearing that now grudgingly start to come out. Um, but it interests me when I read this stuff to speculate on at what point are they going to slam the lid on it? Because if you look back to 50, uh, 52 and 53 when Kehoe was making progress and then that was the end of it. So he was in that position in, in a sense where admissions were being made. But then all that came to an end. So it will be interesting to see how, how many more and how, how far it goes. Well, it, it seems to be the case uh, consistently that within the government, there are different camps. One might say there's a camp that says that we have to keep this secret. There are military implications. We don't want our adversaries to uh, know what we know. And maybe if uh, we we learn just a little bit more than we already know, we can develop weapons and have military superiority as a result of all of this. And then you have a camp that's saying the public deserves to know more and we, we have to let this information out. Exactly. History is repeating itself. Um, and the arguments are largely the same, that if we've got this technology, uh, if it is our technology, why aren't we using it? Um, Sure, any nation that had that technology would have great superiority over any other nation. Uh, why don't they land on the White House lawn if they're here? You know, the, 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 the arguments are the same, and the reasoning is the same. Uh, so, in a sense, although, as you said, Congress and so forth is a bit more open about the subject, it's, it's still not moved on very far. Uh, we haven't changed. No, I suppose it's moved along, I mean, in my lifetime, a little bit. Uh, there's still a long, long way to go. Well, Linda, this has been a very informative conversation about a very crucial historical period in the field of ufology. Do you have any final thoughts about uh, the career of Donald Kehoe as we close our interview? I would say that it's probably fair to say he was the father of ufology, if that doesn't sound too grand a term. There wasn't really anything going on. Arnold had his sighting, and that created the interest. But Kehoe was the first person to dig into what was going on and to point fingers at authority and say, tell us, please, uh, or at least tell us why you're not telling us. Um, and it set the it set the ground, if you like, for where we are, and uh, and it shows the uh, it shows the lack of progress in spite of everything you tried to do. So I think we give him uh, credit for being the first, the first of the many who have, have followed that. Um, and although he was, I think unwittingly responsible for the contactees getting traction because they rode on his coattail to some extent. We've still got that element in our society. But altogether, he was a highly significant individual, uh, historically important. Of course, this is important, I think, in the history of American 20th century history because it, it was, and still is regarded as an American phenomenon, which is not true, of course, because... We have sightings everywhere. But yes, a very important man. And uh, I, I, think, um, I think he deserved a biography uh, after all, after 75 years. Well, you've done an admirable job, an amazing piece of research, six years of hard work, 
Uh, once again, I encourage our viewers to take a look at your book, Against All Odds. So, Linda Powell, thank you so much for being with me today and sharing your vast knowledge with our viewers. And thank you. I've, I've enjoyed it very much. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.